The Supreme Court heard arguments Wednesday in a case challenging the Bush administration's jailing of hundreds of Guantanamo prisoners without charge or trial. Lawyers for the Center for Constitutional Rights argued the prisoners have been unconstitutionally denied the writ of habeas corpus, the right to challenge their imprisonment before a judge. Speaking outside the court, Center for Constitutional Rights President Michael Ratner said every prisoner deserves a day in court or a fair tribunal. The right to present evidence before a neutral tribunal and in which they can see the charges against them. That's what we want. We're very hopeful and optimistic by the argument today uh, that this is what uh, the people we represent at Guantanamo will get. Protesters, including law school students, gathered outside the Supreme Court. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Washington, D.C., where the Supreme Court heard arguments Wednesday in a case challenging the Bush administration's jailing of hundreds of Guantanamo prisoners without charge or trial. At issue is an appeals court ruling denying prisoners the writ of habeas corpus, the right to challenge their imprisonment before a judge. Lawyers for the prisoners argue the ruling is unconstitutional and the Bush administration's military tribunal system an inadequate alternative. The session marked the third time since 2004 the Supreme Court took up a challenge to Guantanamo detentions. The court ruled against the Bush administration both previous times. In 2004, the court said federal courts have jurisdiction over cases filed from Guantanamo. Two years later, the court struck down the Bush administration's initial military tribunal system for trying selected prisoners. That decision led to the establishment of a new tribunal system endorsed by Congress just over a year ago. Representing the prisoners was Seth Waxman, the former Solicitor General under President Bill Clinton. In his opening statement, Waxman said Guantanamo prisoners are being denied their basic legal rights. The petitioners in these cases have three things in common. First, all have been confined at Guantanamo for almost six years, yet not one has ever had meaningful notice of the factual grounds of detention or a fair opportunity to dispute those grounds before a neutral decision maker. Two, under the decision below, they have no prospect of getting that opportunity. And three, each maintains, as this court explained in Rasul, that he is, quote, innocent of all wrongdoing. Now, the government contends that these men are detainable, and the facts of these 37 cases differ, and it may well be that an adjudicatory process that preserves the core features of common law habeas would reveal, perhaps, that some of these petitioners are lawfully detainable, but limited DTA review of the structurally flawed CSRT process cannot provide any reliable examination of the executive's asserted basis for detaining these petitioners, let alone an adequate substitute for traditional habeas review. For more on the Supreme Court hearing, I'm joined by Vincent Warren. He's executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, the group representing Guantanamo prisoners. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Vince. Thank you, Amy. It's great to be here. Explain the significance of the case yesterday and the questioning, the line of questioning of the Supreme Court justices. Well, the significance of the case is that the Supreme Court is really going to figure out whether in this country we have a king that's not bound by the rule of law and someone who can lock people up indefinitely for the rest of their lives, perhaps just on his say-so alone, or whether we have a president that's bound by the rule of law or and by the Constitution. Uh, the issue here was that the president and the Congress had said that there was no habeas corpus that extended, constitutional habeas corpus that extended to the detainees. Our argument was that the Constitution says habeas corpus shall not be uh, suspended, and therefore, by not extending habeas to the, to the uh, detainees, that that's exactly what uh, the president and Congress did. The next step is if the, if the Supreme Court agrees with that, which, uh, we're, which we're thinking they're likely to do, the the next question is whether the procedures that were passed by the Detainee Treatment Act um, are an adequate substitute for habeas corpus. And, of course, we're saying that they're not, because it's essentially a sham kangaroo court uh, and, a, and a court review that only uh, asks the question of whether the uh, military complied with its own procedures, and it's not a meaningful review of uh, the military proceedings whatsoever. 
Prisoner attorney Seth Waxman also cited the case of Murat Karnaz, uh, who was held for more than four years despite U.S. acknowledgement of his innocence. Declassified documents show the military tribunal overseeing Karnaz's case ignored explicit evidence showing U.S. intelligence had exonerated him. During his imprisonment, Karnaz says he suffered severe torture. He was finally released in August 2006, nearly five years after his capture. In his closing arguments, Waxman said Karnaz was able to go free because he was granted the rare privilege of an attorney. Mr. Karnaz is the other petitioner who's discussed in her brief. He was a petitioner in this court, but he has since been released by the government because the fact that he had what the CSRTs won't give him, which is a lawyer. He was told, two years after he was detained, he's a German permanent resident, he was told at his CSRT, as many of these individuals were not, that he was being held because he associated with a known terrorist. And he was told the name. He was told that he associated with somebody called Selkuk Bilgin, who the government contended was A, a terrorist, who was, had blown himself up while Mr. Kurnaz was in detention. May I simply finish this account? While he was in detention and in a suicide bombing. And all that Mr. Kurnaz could say at his CSRT, where he had no lawyer and had no access to information, was I, I never had any reason to suspect he was a terrorist. Well, when the government in the habeas proceedings filed its factual return in Judge Green's court, it filed as its factual return the CSRT record. His counsel saw that accusation. Within 24 hours, his counsel had affidavits not only from the German prosecutor, but from the supposedly deceased Mr. Bilgen, who is a resident of Dresden, never involved in terrorism, and fully getting on with his life. That's what and that evidence would not have been in, allowed in under DTA review. It wouldn't have been in in the CSRT, and it won't come in under DTA review, and that's why it's inadequate. That was Seth Waxman, the former Solicitor General under President Clinton. He was making the oral arguments um, on behalf of the prisoners.